glad you're here. Hope you've had a good week. And uh, good to be back with you tonight and just come and worship and study God's Word together. Uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12 tonight is where we're going to be at. So if you want to go ahead and take your Bibles and be turning to Mark chapter 12. And as we're turning there, let me just share with you from Psalms 34 verses 7 and 18. You know, this has been a, a rough week for our nation with a shooting in Nashville. And a lot of people, uh, of course, using this for political reasons, but it's heartbreaking that three nine-year-olds lost their life and three adults lost their life. And so, um, but a lot of people heartbreaking, I mean, brokenhearted, if I can say it right, over this. And, and uh, But, you know, God is a God who, who helps us and is there for us in times like this. And so Psalms 34, 17 and 18 says this, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. And delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who are broken heart, broken hearted, or excuse me, have a broken heart, if I read it right, and saves such a, as have a contrite spirit. So, you know, it says the righteous cry out. I mean, when all that we're facing in our nation, that's definitely one thing we need to be doing is we need to be crying out to God. And the promise is there that the Lord hears us, you know, is what it says in verse 17 of Psalm 34. And he promises to deliver us out of our troubles. Now, we're not going to be done with all our troubles until we get to glory. But that promise is coming. That one day, we won't have to face the troubles of this world. We won't have to worry about school shootings anymore or anything like that. Or Christians being targeted or anything like that. And so, um, you know, we're, gonna, we're going to have that day coming, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. But he does promise this. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. So, many people in this nation have a broken heart. Many Christians are heartbroken over what happened in Nashville this week. And so I'm thankful that God doesn't forget us in the midst of our trouble. God doesn't forget us in the midst of our heartbreak. But he's near and he's there with his presence. And he's there with all that he is to comfort us and to strengthen us and to see us through days that, of things that break our hearts. So that's just encouraging to think about as we come and worship our great God together. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we are thankful for who you are. And we give you praise for who you are. And Father, I just uh, am thankful that you're a God who tells us to cry out to you, and you promise to hear us, Lord, in this Psalms, and you promise that one day you will deliver us from all the troubles we face in this world, and what a great day that would be when you take us home to glory, and we look forward to that day, but until then, we will face days like we have this week where our hearts are broken over what takes place around us, or what takes place even in our own lives, but you promise that you are near. And I'm thankful for your presence in our life. I'm thankful that you are there to comfort us and to strengthen us and sustain us and to see us through. And God, I'm just thankful for who you are. And I pray tonight that we will honor and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 12 is where we're going to be tonight as we continue our study dealing with Christian characteristics. Years ago, there was a man by the name of Russell Herman, and he was 67 years old when he died in 1994. And uh, in his will, he had some pretty phenomenal requests that he left for to be carried out in his will. Included in his will was the distribution of more than $2 billion for the city of East St. Saint Louis, another billion and a half for the state of Illinois, two and a half billion for the National Forest System. And the top off that list, Herman left $6 trillion to the government to help pay off the national debt. Now, you may think that's a very generous guy to be leaving that much money behind to these different locations of cities or organizations or what have you. But the only problem was that when Herman died, he only had one asset to his name. It was a 1983 Oldsmobile. You know, he made great promises that he was leaving all this money and act like he would in his will. But the problem was, he, although he appeared to be generous, he actually wasn't generous at all. At all. If you think about it, as Christians, we're called to be generous. Because Jesus Christ himself is generous. As we continue talking about these different characteristics that we're looking at of, of being Christ-like, one of the evidence that we're Christ-like is we are generous in how we deal with people. I mean, think about how generous Jesus has been to us, that Jesus gave us everything we need for eternal life. He supplied the way to have forgiveness of sins. He supplied the way to heaven. He supplied the way for us to have a relationship with Almighty God and so much more. And he calls us to be generous. And so tonight we're looking at a, a part of Jesus' ministry where we see this kind of lived out. It's a remarkable account of his ministry. And the reason it's so remarkable is because of what Jesus saw, but also because of what he said as well. It's a great example of generosity. So as we look at this passage of Scripture tonight, we realize that we can't fool Jesus. Just like Russell Herman thought he could fool a lot of people by having this will that really couldn't be carried out because all he had was a 1983 Oldsmobile. 
You know, we can't fool Jesus. We may be able to fool each other and think we're generous in how we deal with people and how we deal with our finances and things like that. But Jesus really knows. And if we're going to be Christ-like, we're called to be generous. And, and tonight we realize in these truths that I want to share with you that we, if we have these things in our life, I mean, if we see these things in our life, we will be encouraged to be generous like Jesus is. Because we know what Jesus sees it all. He knows it all. We can't fool him. So if we're going to be Christ-like, we must be generous. And the first truth we see is this. Jesus knows how generous we are. If we really are going to be generous, we have to realize Jesus knows how generous we are. We can't fool Jesus, as I said. Now, Jesus must have really been bored this day in his ministry because he goes to the temple and he's had maybe having a slow day. And basically he goes and watches what people are putting in the offering box. Look at what it says there in verse 41. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury and many who were rich put in much. I mean, when you walked in the temple at that time, there was a certain section where it was the offering section, where the offerings were received. And Jesus per- personally, I mean, purposely sat down and had a front row view of what was taking place. It was kind of ironic as you think about when Jesus was teaching and Jesus was doing miracles, many people wanted to have a front row view of what Jesus was doing. So Jesus now has this front row seat of what is taking place in this section of the temple where people were bringing their offerings. Um, you know, I could understand if it was sitting down to a football game or sitting down to even a concert or a play, even having front row seats, but really watching someone put their money in the offering is not terribly exciting. I mean, today, if we had somebody sitting out there and watching everybody come that door and, and putting their money in the offering box, people would say, that's just plain rude, or, or you're sticking your nose in other people's business where it doesn't belong. And, and so, um, but here's the reality. Jesus doesn't just watch the offering box back then. He's still watching it today. He watches to see how generous we are. He notices how generous we are. Um, now, Jesus was not the only one watching that day. This treasury that where the, you had deposited your offerings back then was a public place. And the people in that temple would come by and they could hear, they could see people deposit their offerings. Now, their offering boxes were a little bit different than the offering boxes we have. There are actually 13 trumpet-shaped offering receptacles there. And so what would happen is people would come by with their coins, and they would throw them into these trumpet-shaped receptacles, and they'd make a loud of clanging noises and ringing noises, and you could hear them running around in there. And I don't know if y'all ever remember those things at the mall where you, you had this big, like, up, upside-down horn thing, and you put a little coin in it, and it spun around and around and around and around, and finally it dropped in. But imagine dropping a bunch of coins in there and making all this noise. And what people were doing is they were drawing attention to themselves, saying, look how much I'm giving. Look at all the money that I'm giving. And that's what rich people would do back then, is they would, they would draw attention to themselves. And people could hear it, and people could see it. And everybody knew the people that gave a lot of money. And that's why we're told there in verse 1 that the rich put in much. They put in much because everybody heard what they were putting. Now, they, they didn't have to guess, you know, that rich people were putting much. You just saw it, and you heard it as well. And that was known as what was called sounding the trumpet so everybody could hear it. Well, Jesus was very observant. We know that. He knows what people were giving. He knew exactly how much people were putting in. And he was well aware that the rich people were putting in large sums of money. This is other people were too as well. Now, understand this. Jesus is not condemning rich people for, for being rich. He's not condemning rich people for giving a lot of money. I mean, he loves a cheerful giver, whether they're, they're rich or they're poor. And the rich people, you know, they, they do a lot of good things in our world today. Think about it. People, a lot of rich people have good hearts. And a lot of the charity work that's taking place in our society is done by rich people that have the means to do it. So we're thankful. But that's not the point. The point that Mark is making here is that Lord, the Lord knows how generous people are or how generous they're not. He sees what we're giving. He sees how we handle his money. He sees how we take care of people and, and, or how we don't. He knows when we give and he knows when we don't. So when Jesus looks at our life, what does he see? Does he see that we're truly generous? Do we see, does he see that, that we are like him in this aspect that we're willing to give and sacrifice for others? He calls us to be generous. Now, the second truth we see is this. Jesus sees the true amount of our gener- generosity. He sees the true amount of our generosity. We would never know, would never have known this widow uh, story if, if verses had stopped there at verse 41. Because what happened in verse 41 is it's not out of the ordinary. This is something that happened every day. But really what got Jesus' attention is what takes place in verse 42. Look what it says. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants. Now talk about this unlikely hero, if you will. So here's this lady, and, and people will look upon this lady as, as an outcast. People will look upon this lady as a, they would really count her as a three-time loser. One, she was poor. 
And people back then, as they people do today, they looked down upon the poor people. Second, she was a widow. And people, widows were looked down upon, and she, people would know she's a widow because widows dressed a certain way. But third, simply because she's a woman, because let's just be honest, women were not treated fairly back then. You know, they were treated as second-class citizens. So they would not see what Jesus saw. They just saw her as a poor widow. They just saw her as a loser. No big deal. But she catches Jesus' attention. Jesus is watching so closely as he sees something that no one else saw. With his, with his supernatural vision, if you will, he, he sees that she's putting in these two small coins. Now, these two small coins were the smallest and least valuable pieces of money in circulation that day. And the average daily wage, uh, from what we can tell back then, was about what we equate to like 15 cents a day. You know? So these two coins put together would be less than one-tenth of one cent. And nobody gave her offering a second thought. Nobody gave her two coins a second thought. But Jesus gave it a second thought. Jesus gave it a second look. He's so impressed by what she gave, and he calls his disciples over to take notice. He wants to see what what they've done. Now, honest, Jesus makes a statement here, and his disciples probably thought that he was crazy. Look what he says in verse 43. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. So all those rich people in verse 41 that came by and put in all their, all their money, all this, all this coins that everybody heard, everybody saw, and all the clanging going on. Jesus said to his disciples, this poor widow with her two small coins has put in more than everybody that has already put into the treasury. I mean, the disciples probably think that there's no way. I mean, this is like one-tenth of a penny, you know, and how could this be more than what all the rich people put in together? Now, we learn a lesson about generosity. The most generous givers do not necessarily always give the largest gifts, according to Jesus' standard. Simply put, generosity is not always measured by what we give, by how much we give. There's a difference between giving the greatest amount and being the most generous giver. And that's what Jesus is looking for, the most generous giver. A million dollars may be a dream gift for somebody, but that may not not make you the, the dream giver. There may be someone that gives less, but they're sacrificing more. What this poor widow teaches us is that you don't have to be rich to be generous. And you don't have to have a lot to give. Jesus doesn't measure what people give the way that that we measure what people give. I mean, he doesn't look at the proportion of what people give, or or the portion of what people give. He looks at the proportion of what people give. You know, what the sacrifice that they're making. We look at what is put in. Jesus looks at what is left over. Are they really sacrificing, or are they just giving out of their abundance? One of these days, we're going to find out that some of the most generous people who ever lived on this earth were some of the poorest people who ever lived on this earth. Jesus was not impressed with the greatness of what we give, but he is impressed with the generosity of what we give. Are we making that sacrifice? Are we using his money wisely? Now, going back to the temple here, everybody would applaud those rich people. They would have heard all those coins going in those receptacles. They would have heard all the clanging going on, and they would have applauded the rich people. But nobody would have applauded this poor widow. But one would have. Jesus would have. If you stop and think about it, that's the only one that matters. In our giving, in our generosity, and how we're generous to the church, and how we're generous to other people, and how we're generous to people in need, and how we're generous, how the Lord leads us to be generous with His money and with His possessions. They're not ours. Y'all realize that. It all belongs to Him. You know, we're not seeking to impress other people. We're seeking to please God. And that's what really matters. See, Jesus sees the true amount of our generosity. He knows, are we giving out of abundance or are we truly sacrificing? Does it really cost us to do what he's called us to do? When we give, are we bringing honor and glory to him? Now, there's one more truth we see here. Jesus knows the motive of our generosity as well. This poor widow becomes a hero of the story. She didn't even know that the story was being written, you know. But Jesus sums up why he's so you know, just enamored with this woman because of the gift she gave. Look what it says in verse 44. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Once again, reminded just how poor she was. So he's already mentioned she's a poor widow, but now he uses that word poverty. And the Greek text has two different words there. They're completely different words. The first word translated poor describes someone who is totally destitute. I mean, they're a beggar. She, she probably was homeless, and today probably would have been someone who's dependent upon public assistance. And then there's a second word, poverty, and that basically means having nothing. You know, Jesus is getting a, giving us a clear picture of her condition. 
And that, but notice what she gives. Don't miss what Jesus says there in verse 44. You know, she really gave more than just money, according to what Jesus says. Look what he says, that she put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. What that literally is saying is that she gave her all. She gave her life is what it's giving. She was willing to give it all. We see this lady not just giving her money, but she's giving herself. We see that she's not just giving what she had, but she's willing to give all that she has. The reason why this woman could give all her money to God is because she already made a decision that she was going to give her life to God. She was willing to sacrifice it all. The easy part for this woman was giving her money. The hard part is giving her heart. Isn't that the hard part for all of us? That we, that we give our heart, we give our all to God. But she was willing to give her livelihood, give her all. And what really impressed Jesus was not that what she gave, but why she gave, the motive behind it. It wasn't the amount that impressed Jesus, but it was her attitude that impressed Jesus. That she was willing to sacrifice everything for God. Now, keep in mind, she was not going to get a tax deduction. I mean, a lot of people give to charitable organizations like a church for a tax deduction. We've got to have tax right off to, to bring down some of those taxes we've got to pay. Now, she didn't give, give to just show off. Like some people probably went in there with their coins, and you ever been, you know, into the bank and they have one of those coin machines, and you see somebody in there with a big old pickle jar they're dumping in there? That's the picture of probably what some people did. They came in there and just made a big show of it. She didn't do it to show off. She wasn't looking for anybody to be impressed with her. She probably even embarrassed if anybody even noticed that she was giving. And she didn't do it flippantly because she really thought about what she was giving. She was careful to think about the sacrifice she was making. And her actions spoke so loudly about the condition of her heart that she was willing to give her all for God and she was willing to trust God for everything else. I mean, think about it. She gave everything she had. So essentially, she's saying, God, I trust you to meet my needs. God, I, I love you more than my money. God, I, I want to live for you, and I just trust you. If you do give to the Lord's work, if you're practicing generosity, think about this, why do you give? Why do you give? I mean, you think about the IRS. Here it is, tax season. The IRS doesn't care why you give. They just want their money. They don't care why you give them money. And most of us really don't want to give them money, but we have to give them money, you know? The mortgage company that you pay every month, you pay your mortgage, they don't care why you give your money, they just want their money. The credit card company, if you have credit card debt, you wipe, you know, or you're paying off credit cards or whatever it is, they don't care why you give, they just want their money. God cares why you give. Because he really does, it's not about the money, it's about the heart. That's the motive behind our giving, that we're living right with God, that we're seeking to bring honor and glory to God, and how we're generous with what God has given us. An even bigger question is maybe for those who don't give is, why people don't give. People may say, well, I just can't afford to give. Let's just be honest. Here's what people are saying when they say, I can't afford to give to God. What they're saying is, I can't afford, well, I can't afford to give, but I just don't want to change my lifestyle. I don't want to sacrifice some of the things that I'm enjoying. I don't want to sacrifice. I've always got to have a new this, or I've always got to have, have a new that. And if I give my money to God, give some of my money to God, I can't have a new this. I can't have a new that. I've got to sacrifice some of my lifestyle. So let's just put this in perspective. We're talking tonight about this poor widow. Don't know her name. Don't know where she came from, where she lived, or we don't even know how she died. But 2,000, later, 2000 years later, we still remember her. We're still talking about her generosity because it stood out to Jesus Christ. Think about this. What are we going to be remembered for? We're not going to be remembered for how much money we made, how much money we spent, how much money we saved. But people will remember us if we're generous or not. And God doesn't reward us based on how much we made or how much we spent or how much we saved. God rewards us on how generous we are with what is His. It's all His anyways. The greatest reason why all of us should be generous, whether we have a little or we have a lot, is because we have a generous God. Stop and think about how generous God has been to us. God has been so generous that he sent Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross for us so we could have forgiveness of sin, so we could have this very expensive gift of everlasting life. And it's absolutely free. That's how generous God is, and so much more. God has blessed every single one of us. We all come from different backgrounds. We all have different history. But all of us in this room can say God has blessed us tremendously. Because he has. God has been generous to us. And if we're going to be Christ-like, he calls us to take on that characteristic of generosity as well. 
not to be selfish. That's today's society. Of, and it has been you know, our society for thousands of years that it's all about me. We live in a society that it's all about me. That's not the way of the Christian, though. That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus was selfless. He gave his all for us. Talk about generosity. When Jesus came to this world, he gave everything, including his very life, so we could have life. So here's a question. Are we truly generous people in God's eyes? Not according to what this world says, not according to what our tax statements say, not according to whoever. What does God think about our generosity? Are we living out of that characteristic? Now, oftentimes when a preacher talks about money, people don't like to hear it. And, uh, you know, I'm guessing uh, nobody knew what I was talking about tonight. So I don't know why we have a smaller crowd, but that's okay. But, you know, I mean, that's just, you know, people always complain when a preacher talks about money. Well, friend, I'm just being true to God's word because God's word talks about money. God's word talks about generosity. And here's the kicker. We shouldn't have a problem being generous because it's not ours anyways. It all belongs to him. Father, you have called us to be generous. And Lord, I know people in this room are generous. I know this church is generous, Lord. Lord, you, you, we've seen that this week in the offering at Tables of Love, our biggest offering ever for missions. We've seen that this, this past week at Community Revival with the offering for Cry Freedom Missions. And Lord, I, I, just how your people have given through hardship, your people have given through COVID, and you have just blessed tremendously financially Red Mountain Baptist Church. We're thankful for that. We see generosity of your people and how they're giving towards the building fund and that loan's coming down. But Father, we could always do more because you've done everything for us. There's always more people to reach. There's always more people to share the love of Christ with. And Lord, we may be sitting among people that are very generous. I don't know what people give. I only know what I give. But Father, I pray we'll always strive to be generous. Because the selfish side of us, the fleshly side of our sinful nature says, let's just keep it all for ourselves. I deserve this. I'm entitled to this. When reality is it's not ours anyways. All the possessions we have are yours. All the money we have is yours. Lord, I pray we're good stewards of it. And we live with a spirit of generosity that reflects the love of God to this world around us and brings honor and glory to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.